Thank you so much for that warm reception. Now I know how the donkey felt that brought Jesus into Jerusalem. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. You may be seated. I want to say it's a privilege to have the opportunity to minister to the saints of God at Christian House of Prayer in Copper's Cove, Texas. We appreciate Bishop Holcomb, a great man of God with an anointing of God upon his life. I know the folk in New Orleans are being blessed. But as Dr. O'Donnell read from my bio, I was an agnostic at one time. I didn't know if there was a God. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And I heard about this fourth grade teacher on the first day of school standing up and announcing to her students that she was an atheist. Then she proceeded to ask, if there were any other atheists in class that day, every child but one little girl raised their hand. Because children want to be like their teachers, and probably most of those fourth grade students didn't know what an atheist was. So the teacher went back to that little girl and said, you're not an atheist. She said, no, I'm not. She said, what are you then? She said, I'm a Christian. And she said, why would that be? She said, my father and my mother are Christians. And the teacher said, that's the most ridiculous excuse I can think of for you to be a Christian just because your parents are Christians. Then the teacher said, now, if your father was an idiot and your mother was an imbecile, what would you be? The little girl thought for a moment, said, well, then, teacher, in that case, I guess I would be an atheist. It's all right to laugh in the house of God. Psalm 144.15 says, Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 16.11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of vinegar juice, prune juice, lemon juice. That's not what the psalmist said. He said in his presence is fullness of joy. But you might get that impression by looking at some people's faces when they go to church. Some folk, when they walk in church, look like they've just paid their taxes. And Pastor Miller, some folk, when they walk out of church, look like they've been to the dentist's office for a tooth extraction. The 100th Psalm doesn't say, Make a mournful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with sadness. Come before His presence with moans and groans and gripes and complaints. I could have misquoted that way in some places, no doubt. I would have gotten a hearty amen, brother preacher. That's how we see it. <laughs> but the hundredth Psalm says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth unto all generations. Christ came, John 10, 10, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. I've told people when I got saved, I didn't stop drinking. I just changed my fountain. <laughs> Jeremiah 23, 9 says, I'm like a drunken man and like a man who whineth overcome because of the Lord and the words of His holiness. I didn't stop dancing. I just changed my partner. Psalm 149.3 says, Let them praise His name in the dance. 2 Samuel 6.14 says, David danced before the Lord with all of his might. So that's right to dance and shout and be excited about Jesus. 
Oh, but they might call me a fanatic. My definition of a fanatic is this. Somebody more turned on to Jesus than you are. Psalm 104.4 says, He'll make His ministers a flame of fire. John the Baptist introduced Jesus in Matthew 3.11 as He which would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hebrews 12.29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, I've got a fire shut up in my bones. Now I know I'm in Texas, but Jeremiah wasn't talking about Tex-Mex food. He wasn't talking about burritos or enchiladas. What was Jeremiah talking about, preacher? He was talking about God's Word. In Jeremiah 23, 29, he said, It's not my word like as of a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I was born in the fire, and the smoke won't do. Jesus, deliver me, preacher. You don't have to be so animated. You don't have to be so excited. Yes, I do. I feel like David, Psalm 86, 13, Great is thy mercy toward me, for thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Jesus rescued me just in time. Hallelujah. And I'm eternally grateful to Him for His mercy and grace. But it's great to be in the house of God. It's actually better to be the house of God. David said in Psalm 122, When I was glad, when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, some folks instead of being like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like Sad Sack, Bad Back, and Back to Bed I Go. <laughs> now, I am from West Virginia, and the psalmist David might have been a West Virginian. He said in Psalm 121, 1, I'll lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made the heaven and the earth. Thank God there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's some places where if you smile too big or shout too loud, people wonder what kind of sin have you committed. But Proverbs 13, 15 says, The way of a transgressor is hard. First Peter 1, 8 says, Salvation is joy unspeakable and it's full of glory. Isaiah 12, 3 says, With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Hallelujah! There's joy in the house of God here tonight. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 50. It is a distinct honor and privilege to have Pastor Bob Miller in service at Christian House of Prayer here tonight. A longtime friend of myself and my wife. We appreciate he and Sister Barbara. They mean a whole lot to a lot of folk. Thank you, Brother Miller, for being here tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to talk about an attitude of gratitude. You know, the Lord saved me and delivered me. And I like to talk about it. Twenty-nine years ago, I exchanged my Bartles and James for a Bible and Jesus. I took off that old black velvet and put on a white robe. All right, all right, all right. Yes, sir. I didn't know what a buzz was until I got turned on to Jesus. All right, all right, all right. Because there is no high like the most high. Right. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 6, He has raised us up to sit in heavenly places in Christ. I want to talk about an attitude of gratitude. Look at verse 50 of Psalm chapter Verse 15 of Psalm chapter 50. David wrote these words down around 3,000 years ago. Yet these words are apropos to you and I here tonight in the 21st century. And this is God speaking to His people. 
and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. David talked about a day of trouble. Oh, Brother Emmanuel, Bishop Holcomb, I don't have any trouble in my life. Welcome back from your coma. <laughs> Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Christ said in John 16, 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We live in a fallen world, in a decadent society. Christ said in Matthew 24, 37, For as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Brother Emmanuel, Bishop Holcomb, how were conditions on the earth when Noah lived? We're glad you asked that question. Genesis 6, 5 says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the heart of man was evil continually and it grieved the Lord at his heart and God determined to send a flood of waters upon that antediluvian society. But verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God's always had a remnant. God has a remnant to this present hour. The church isn't going out. The church, church isn't going under. Thank God the church is going through. Some people think the church is going out of existence, but it's not. Christ said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Isaiah 59, 19 says, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. Christ is coming back for His church. Yes. Then you and I are going to vacate the premises. Then seven years later, we're coming back with Jesus. Ephesians 5, 26 says that He might sanctify and cleanse in the church with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the people Jesus, Dr. O'Donnell, is coming back for. We're going to wax strong in these last days, but we do live in a difficult time. Daniel 11.32, talking about the time of the end, says, The people that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Psalm 41.11 says, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. Isaiah 54.17 says, No weapon formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Amen. Hebrews 13.6 says, That we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. David wrote down in Psalm 27.1, The Lord is my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One plus God makes a majority. Paul said in Romans 8.31, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Paul described the time in which you and I are living in 2 Timothy 3, 1. He said, This know also, in the last days perilous times shall come. The word perilous means dangerous. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Then he said in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then he said in verse 13, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But we're going to see a great move of God in these last days. This isn't hype, this is hope, based on the Word of God. Habakkuk 2.14 says, The knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Brother Manuel, Bishop Holcomb, how will that come about? Psalm 68 verse 11, The Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it or made it known. All right, all right, all right. We have our marching orders. 
I've been full-time now for 18 years as an evangelist. My motto is, have gospel, we'll travel. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Mark 16, 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. How many folk here tonight want to help hasten Christ's return? We can help make it happen. The angels spoke to those Galileans in Acts 1.11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. See, we're waiting for the Lord to come. And he's waiting for us to go. And we're waiting for him to come. And he's waiting for us to go. My record isn't broke. I'm just trying to emphasize a point. We're waiting for him to come. He's waiting for us to go. And unless we go, he won't come. And we're going to preach this gospel as a witness. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. Mark 16, 19 says, After the Lord had spoken unto them, He was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth. They didn't stay home. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, We are laborers together with God. Christ said in John 15, 16, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and ordained you that you should go home, lie in the hammock, and drink lemonade all afternoon. You folk know the word too well. <laughs> he said that you would go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain the whatever you ask of the Father my name, He may give it to you. So he said in the day of trouble, we shouldn't fear what the devil might do. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You see, I have an acronym for the word fear. False evidence appearing real. 2 yeah. right, right. Corinthians 5.7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, transitory, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. He said in the day of trouble, He said, call upon me. Trouble will come to everybody. Nobody is immune to problems. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. A lady came down to prayer line several years back. Brother Emmanuel, she said, pray for me. She said, I'm tired of being persecuted. Do you have any suggestions? I said, ma'am, I've got the answer. She says, what is it? I said, if you don't want to be persecuted, live an ungodly life. She jumped back, her eyes widened. She had a startled expression on her face. She said, Dear God, preacher, I don't want to do that. I said, Then you're going to be persecuted. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, All that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christ said in Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when, not if, matter could, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Christ said in John 15, 18, If the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore doth the world hate you. James 4, 4 says, If we're a friend of the world, that makes us an enemy of God. There's going to be friction. 
between the children of God and the children of darkness. 1 John three ten says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. We're living in trouble sometimes. He said, Call upon me. You and I called on the name of Jesus when He saved us. Joel 2.32, Acts 2.21, Romans 10.13 says, Whosoever, thank God it's an all-inclusive gospel, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isaiah 45.22 says, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. 2 Peter 3.9 says, He's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Christ died for whosoever will. Black, white, yellow, brown, tall, short, skinny, fat, educated, uneducated, rich or poor. God loves you as much as He loves anybody else. And there's nobody else God loves any more than He loves you. Romans 2.11 says, There's no respect of persons with God. I heard about this man that was approaching 90 years of age, Pastor Miller. This man had never been to church, never read the Bible. He became curious about what the Bible would have to say, went to a Bible bookstore, purchased a Bible, took it home, and he began to read the Word of God, fell under conviction, repented of his sin, was gloriously saved. Well, he decided, I guess now I need to start going to church. So the next Sunday he went to a church, not knowing it was a socialized church, and he wore his farm clothes to the service. Well, the preacher got put out with him after church. He went back. He said, Now, sir, before you come back to our church next week, you need to pray and find out what you're supposed to wear at our church services. So the next Sunday rolled around. He went to church with his work clothes on once again. Now the socialite pastor's really mad. He went back. He said, sir, did you do what I asked you to do last week? He said, yes, I did. Did you pray and ask God what you're supposed to wear at our church services? He said, certainly. He said, well, then what did God tell you? He said, well, the Lord told me he didn't know what to wear to your church since he hadn't been there. First Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. Christ said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Christ said in John 7, 24, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This preacher was preaching one night on TV. He looked out, he said, Now ladies, he said, If you like to wear your hair up in a bun, he said, Go for it. He said, but if you think that draws you closer to God or makes you a stronger believer, he said, that's not the case. And he went out preaching, and then he stopped. He said, the Lord told me I need to pray for some ladies out in TV land that need to be delivered from bondage. <laughs> God's concerned about heart salvation, not head religion. Second Chronicles 69 says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. He said in the day of trouble, he said, call on me. Psalm 34, 6 says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is nigh to all they that call upon Him, to all they that call upon Him in truth. Amen. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He heareth the prayer of the righteous. 1 Peter 3, 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In the day of trouble, put your trust in the Lord. Too many people use God like an Anison. The only time they reach for an Anison is when they're having a headache. Don't use God as a means of last resort. He ought to be the first one we turn to, not the last one we turn to. Christ said in Matthew 6.33, But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. James 4, 8 says, drawn out of God. God said, I'll draw near to you. Trust in God, not in man. I was preaching a tent meeting back in the late 1980s. And this lady came down to the front of the tent. She said, preacher, I want you to pray for me. She said, I've lost all my confidence in man. I began to dance and shout and praise the Lord. 
She didn't expect me to react that way. She scurried over to where I was at and did her finger like that. I leaned down. She said, Preacher, I don't believe you heard me right. She said, I want you to pray for me. She said, I've lost all my confidence in man. I looked her in the eyes. I said, Good. I said, Now, you could place your faith where it should have been all along in the Lord and not in man. Paul said in Galatians 5, 7, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? Psalm 118, 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to be confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to be confidence in princes. Jeremiah 17, 5 declares, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man 